We here at uh, Polymer Concrete Incorporated want to do a comprehensive uh, bridge joint repair training video that showed every unit operation from surface evaluation and surface prep through uh, demolding for the final product and return to service. Here we showed uh, sounding, uh, in this case, an asymmetric piece of angle iron that had turned loose and was coming out. This is a simulation, so you'll see some movement, but it, uh, it simulates actually what you run into in the field. The value of having several uh, Walmart small hatchets uh, on the job cannot be overemphasized along with a bush axe or a bush hook and several uh, bright high lumen LED flashlights, particularly on night projects. The difficulty of uh, forming a joint and sealing the bottom of the joint without losing the integrity of the joint uh, is shown here where we're taking pieces of seal seal available at Home Depot and Lowe's and various other building supply places that's quarter inch uh, closed cell uh, polyethylene foam and we're using a couple of pieces folded up to seal off the bottom of the joint. We also have and we'll show some things to have available in some photographs of backer rod that may be cut or split and uh, various sizes of backer rod and we can talk through and, and show you and tell you about ways of pulling banjos for large brakes underneath where you actually wire them up and use saw horses and things of that sort. But here we just basically uh, kept it simple to where we were sealing off the bottom, maintaining the integrity of the expansion joint with uh, sheets of uh, foam polyethylene. Once that's uh, sealed off and plugged off in the bottom there, we're actually going to form the joint. And here we're going to show we're using a bond breaker that's made by dissolving a fairly rich amount of um, silicone caulk, make sure it's silicone caulk, uh, and a little bit of gasoline. And uh, the joint form material will be uh, polyisocyanate, again available at uh, Home Depot and Lowe's. Um, we actually uh, write with a Sharpie on it the, uh, which one's the coated side so that won't get confused. And note here that uh, when you're doing the mixing operation you need to be uh, remote from and probably downwind of uh, the actual repair itself because if you spill or blow or splatter any of the silicone caulk and gas on the repair itself it will act as a bond breaker as it is intended to be here. Here we are coating one side of the poly iso board and when they had noted that which side is coated if you can buy white silicone caulk versus clear silicone caulk it shows up a little bit better when you coat it. Once each side of the excuse me, the coated side is coated with it and set aside uh, for uh, 30 minutes to an hour to give the, the silicone caulk time to react and cure out and then we'll coat the other side. What you need to do always is have one more side of the joint uh, than, than the joints you do. In other words, if you're repairing both sides of the bridge joint, you need at least uh, three pieces of uh, of foreign material where the middle piece or pieces uh, act as shims and can be pulled out where the form can be as you'll see later can be collapsed and uh, easily removed. As I said once it's coated uh, and set aside particularly on a hot humid day or whatever you're looking at 30 minutes to an hour cure time you can do this well in advance of the of when you actually need to use them and everything. The silicone caulk is a little bit tender so you, you don't want to get awfully awfully rough with it. Here we're now starting to uh, form the joint and you'll notice that there are two pieces of a uh, cheap paneling, a Luon type of paneling that's uh, in between and it's a little bit too thick here so you'll see that 
as soon as we realize, well, we're a little bit aggressive with our uh, layers there and everything, we'll take one of them out and uh, go ahead and, and slide the form material down into the, the joint to be repaired. Now here you'll notice that we're actually forming the joint before we prime it. Actually, in most cases, this can be done either way to where you prime the joint and then form it, or you can form all the joints and come back and prime them. Uh, you can go in on top of fresh primer any time from uh, immediately putting it down, whether it's gelled or not, to where it's several hours old, but it's nice not to have it probably more than a day old. Um, as you put down the primer so you can wet into it and get a good bond to it. Uh, in this case, uh, by mixing up a little bit of primer, and you'll notice it's got a, uh, the resin has got a little bit of a purplish, uh, pinkish purple tint to it. As soon as the catalyst is added to it, it'll turn to a, a greenish brown. You'll see that noticeable color change. And basically the catalyst bottle is scribed off to where there's one mark per gallon so you use just a little bit, but you can put your thumbnail on it and get a pretty good ratio there that's plenty accurate. Notice the color change for a little bit of catalyst there. When you prime the, the repair area, it's nice to prime a, an inch or so or two uh, outside the perimeter of it and really wet up top, kind of be sloppy and quick and wet with it, and it'll be running down particularly on the vertical surfaces um, as you prime, and then come back and paint out any puddles and everything. So the priming operation goes plenty quick. If there are places down on a surface that's kind of hard to get your brush down to, you can flick the paintbrush a little bit, and uh, it'll wet out, and capillary attraction and everything makes the priming operation go very, very quickly. Usually you've got about uh, 10, 12, 15 minutes to uh, the gel time of the primer, but it, it usually takes just a matter of just a few minutes to go ahead and get all the primer out in place. And it's you can do it either way. If you've got a little bit of primer left, you can just top it off and once you start uh, mixing the polymer concrete, which we'll show next. Or if you got just a little bit left, you can actually just pour that part out and start fresh. Once the primer, uh, as showed here, like I said, is uh, in place, and since we've done it quickly here, and you don't have to worry about the age of the primer being a problem, we just go ahead and top off the measuring pail. You'll notice this measuring pail is uh, scribed off to basically it's uh, one gallon of resin to one bag of mix and there's one mark on the catalyst bottle goes to that one gallon and scribed off there um, and you just put your thumb on it to estimate about it's roughly an inch on a scribed off catalyst bottle to a gallon of resin which is in this case is scribed off on the pail and of course goes to one bag of, of research 2 aggregate blend. You notice the color change here from a pinkish purple to a greenish brown. Now if the wheelbarrow is reasonably clean and in the hot summertime it's nice for it to be reasonably cool if you can keep it shaded with a tarp or a piece of cardboard or something, it helps a little bit and everything. But uh, as you put it in the wheelbarrow, uh, tear open the aggregate blend bag, and of course most often you'll have those pre-opened and pre-torn open. Uh, where you spread it in, you'll see here as we start to pour it in the, the catalyzed resin. Watch this step because it's easy to splash it out. Then using a uh, reasonably clean, actually the cleaner the better, uh, heavy duty garden hoe, you just simply mix it to uh, it's all wetted and, and uh, reasonably homogeneous. Okay. 
the mixing operation here uh, in real time with a, a guy that's mixing it uh, aggressively, almost like he's mad at it, uh, mixing it well and, and scraping the bottom of the pail on virtually every stroke, um, the bottom of the wheelbarrow on virtually every stroke. It takes about 45 seconds to a minute to mix uh, one bag. It'll take uh, a minute to slightly over to mix two bags at a time. And sometimes you want to do that, just two bags, two gallons, and two marks, of course. Now this is one man working on, the, on this particular spall. Normally a crew would have two, three, even four people doing this where somebody could be handing them stuff and somebody could be moving the, the polymer concrete to the other side of this joint and uh, tamping and screeding and making sure it stays to grade uh, all at the same time. Uh, here to, to work one side of a joint and we deliberately let the forming material of course run wild well above the top of the joint. You just butt right up to it and uh, various pieces of clean uh, two by four and actually one by four if it's available uh, works just as well and sometimes a little bit better. But to be able to tamp to consolidate and uh, get the repair liquid full short pieces of two before work well, then you can swap over to a slightly longer piece of two before to make sure that everything is at grade and definitely not above grade as you do the finishing um, screed across the top of the thing by holding it to grade on the bridge deck um, and letting the, the floating in just uh, keep the grade across the top of the repair. Here we use and we mixed up one bag and that was uh, plenty to do uh, this repair here. Uh, but we've got it uh, filled and consolidated uh, on this side here. We'll come back over uh, in a minute here and uh, screed and make sure everything is, is absolutely two grade and, and uh, not above grade. Each time it's screeded over or trialed over, it's always nice to tamp it. And sometimes the, the more aggressive with the tamping, the better. Uh, there are occasions when the, the repair is going to want to uh, fall through the bottom into the um, below the bridge onto the cap or in the creek or whatever below. Uh, what you want to do on that uh, is one is make sure you secure the bottom as well as you practically can. Then if you do see a place where it falls through, if you have the luxury, just uh, give it time to set up or if you've got a place where you can see a problem at the bottom, mix a smaller batch and sometimes even a little bit drier and uh, fill in and secure the bottom before you do the final filling. Here we're showing what actually looks kind of almost amusing, but it's a darn good technique. You pull back that feathered edge back to zero with the toe of your shoe, and uh, that really ties it in and blends it in. And we've looked at repairs done with this technique uh, many, many years later. As a matter of fact, I'll show you uh, later a couple of repairs that were done 24 and 28 years ago that they were done by the same product, uh, virtually the same technique. After the edges pull back uh, and for any wet spots, which could be uh, not a major problem, but uh, easily taken care of, we can just broadcast dry aggregate blend on top. And what that does is that gives excellent uh, skid numbers, wet skid numbers, and makes the repair blend in the surrounding concrete extremely well. You saw us come back over with a hole there just basically to catch any cow patties or little high bumps that may be on top of it there. A square in shovel or a garden hoe will clean that up for writing quality extremely well. But as I said before, you, for writing quality, you want to get two grade, but for really good writing quality, you don't want anything above grade. 
and you can see what amounts to essentially a finished repair here. If you screed across the top and choose to broadcast some more, uh, that technique, of, of course, is fine. We're finishing up the other side of the joint now. Uh, you can see then and see the reason why we don't recommend any type of sawing in general on uh, repairs of this sort because one is the abrasion resistance and the feather edging and overall physical qualities of uh, Resurf 2 polymer concrete are so exceptional that you really don't need to, to saw anything for a uh, wear surface or load bearing surface or anything of that sort. Uh, we actually recommend that the more profile and the more irregular the surfaces are, the better for uh, restraining uh, any type of cure or thermal stresses uh, on the repair itself. And you see in here that we're doing the other side over there to where we feathering out that edge and broadcasting a little bit of dry aggregate blend. Uh, you can set aside a leftover bag or open a bag and set aside for that application. Here in about uh, 30, 45 minutes, um, as soon as uh, you can test the product with a pencil point or a thumbnail, when it's adequately cheesy, you pull out that center shim, which can be paneling or cardboard or wooden shims or whatever, and uh, just knocking it loose early on on it there and uh, demolding. And that's a, a finished repair, other than the fact that if you find any cow patties at any point in time, while they're still cheesy, it's the ideal time to scrape them off. Now, uh, there are a couple things along to augment and enhance the video that we want to talk about and, and show that uh, they're basically the surface uh, evaluation and uh, preparation tools that uh, we want to show here that uh, something to sound the uh, the delaminated or broken or sound for the integrity of the steel on the joint itself. Uh, we use claw hammers basically to sound a brick hammer and hatchet and the hatchet also of course for any chipping particularly down inside the joint, and uh, these hatches for about eight bucks are so readily available at even places like Walmart. So, but it's an extremely valuable tool. The bush axe or the bush hook, or some places call it a Joe blade, and things like that, is a very, very effective tool for uh, cleaning out debris, actually hooking it and pulling it out, or actually in some cases just punching it all the way through onto the cap below. Uh, is an extremely valuable tool. Then you want small, uh, generally chisel bit, sometimes points, but generally chisel bit, uh, chipping hammers from about 12 to yeah, roughly about uh, 20 pounds and everything for surface prep. And of course you want to be able to sandblast and have plenty of compressed air to where you can, once everything's been sounded and chipped, to blast over all the carbonated and contaminated uh, concrete there and be able to blow it out and then examine it and quite often you'll find cracks uh, that you didn't hear or see um, after you've blown it out. Once the surface has been prepped where you think that um, you've done everything that you reasonably can do, the forming operation will uh, take sometimes uh, some creativity but you've got to really be prepared to do it. Uh, the seal seal, the, the products that are available, the foam polyethylene, the poly iso board, uh, half inch, will usually foil lined on both sides, available, both these available at Home Depot and Lowe's. Then various construction material type supply places, you can get various diameters of baccarat and even pipe insulation that we're showing here is something that uh, it makes a, a real good uh, bottom plugging uh, material there. Then uh, some cheap uh, paneling board uh, like Luon or whatever, some of that's uh, 8 to 3 16 thick 
and then several sizes and thicknesses of cardboard will give you availability to to form a joint, whatever the widths are, and uh, to take any hulled out or bigger spot at the bottom of the joint. And as I said before, it may be that you have to pull up a piece of plywood with uh, baling wire and, and a sawhorse sitting on top of it or something to, to put a real bottom in it because uh, this system is somewhat self-leveling and so you've got to essentially make or have a bottom in there of some sorts to keep this stuff from falling all the way through so you can do some consolidation and tamping on top um, as you work it. Now this other uh, photograph shows basically the the filling uh, and finishing tools there. A good strong and kept clean garden hoe. Various pieces you know, almost can't have too many pieces of a uh, two by four where once they get crudded up and gummed up you just throw them away but uh, short pieces that may be 8 to 12 inches long and some pieces maybe 12 to 16 inches long and then some pieces up to 2 or maybe even 3 feet long. Uh, uh, normally uh, what we do, uh, we didn't do it here because this is an above ground simulation but uh, we quite often just dump the wheelbarrow straight into the hole once it's mixed, of course. But a round-end shovel for moving it out or a one or two-gallon bucket for just scooping in the wheelbarrow and moving it to the joints themselves uh, works well. The square-end shovel is more to scoop stuff up off the slab and put it into the hole. Or if it's too far advanced, the best thing to do is just shave it off and, and scoop it up and throw it away, of course. But we showed here the photographs of, of what you need to be ready and that's what this whole video is about is being as prepared and ready and as knowledgeable as you can from the guys who are, are planning these projects, inspecting these projects to the folks who are bidding on the projects and of course the guys in the field who are actually loading up and getting ready and having their people knowledgeable of what it takes to do the projects. So the unit operations that we've broken down here hopefully will help you to understand how to be ready and what to do and what matters uh, when using Resurf 2 to uh, repair bridge joints. The main thing is you can see when we form the joints and do the job that one slab must never put force or pressure or damage the other slab or the repair to the other slab. Uh, and this, this can be thermal if during the day the other both slabs are expanding or when they're under traffic there's quite a bit of relative movement quite often from one slab to the other slab. So we wanted to show you the, the way to be as ready as possible to use the product uh, as well as we know how to use it and be as prepared as you possibly can in a unit operation type fashion. All these materials and tools and everything need to be kept in general as dry as possible and often even as cool as practical uh, before you actually do the job. And uh, then when everybody does their job from good aggressive mixing to reasonably fast and, and with good technique finishing when you're completely ready to do the job and we will talk about and be readily available uh, by phone or email or whatever and we made all those things readily available uh, on our website and uh, quite often we've got business cards and everything out there that tell you that we're available to discuss, to help with 24-7 uh, on literally any project uh, which even includes uh, if you get caught in a big rain, what do you do? Well, we can tell you all those things like if you see a rain coming, you got a joint broken out, prime it immediately if possible. Then you can possibly, even after the rain has passed, go back in and do the repair without any problem at all. So getting the, the surface primed before the rain comes uh, is essential uh, when given that opportunity. If you can see it coming, uh, prime quick and early. Keep everything as dry as possible. This is a polyester based system 
which gives you all sorts of user-friendly attributes to it. But water is not one of them. You want to keep everything as dry as possible uh, before and while you're using the product. And, of course, keep the bags dry, keep water out of the resin, and all those things. So we'll, we'll be available any time that you need us for any problem, any question. And the earlier you can find those and be prepared for them, the better it is for everybody. Thank you very much.